A Day in the Life, Chapter 5. This is one of those chapters that's in two parts, and I'll let you know the point at which it divides, in case you have chores to do in the space. Colin stands with his arms held out straight from his sides, Father James making sure he's got the sleeve length right and a comfortable width across the shoulders. You can put your arms down now. He fetches the sturdy belt and a scrip to hang on it. Here's your pocket. Keep your handkerchief in it safe. You'll be having to confess a sin against holy poverty on your knees in chapter before the abbot, if you lose that. Here's your rosary. Loop it over. That's right. I haven't got any knives at the moment, but I'm sure Brother Cormac will have some in. I'll make certain we have one for you in time for your ceremony. He brings the scapula from the table and lifts it over the young man's head. The sides are tabbed together but loosely so Colin will be able to get his hands in and out, reach his hanky, his rosary, his knife. Father James steps back, inspects him critically, nods in satisfaction. Good. Perfect length. The cowl, likewise, sits on him well. Father James knows he mustn't show off about his craftsmanship, and the young men he kits out in their robes rarely comment. They usually stand like this one, almost overwhelmed by the privilege and wonder of reception into the monastic order, thinking about their vocation, not his stitching. In fact, Father James can't think of one single postulant whose first thought has been, my word, Father James, black linen thread on black wool in all these short days and lowering weather and you managed these wondrously straight lines of such amazingly tiny stitches. Man, you're an artist of the first water. Or his second thought, for that matter. But never mind. Our Lady Queen of Heaven is watching. Offer it up and what more can you ask? Father James ascertains that Colin knows what will be happening. Father will receive you in chapter. You'll be tonsured first. Father John used to be our infirmarian, so he's nifty with a razor. You'll be fine. You'll be wearing your regular tunic, but the chemise I've made you underneath that. No need to be as all for God as Francis of Assisi and stripped to the buff. So then you lay aside your tunic and kneel before the abbot and he dresses you in this lot that I've made in silence. After that he gives you your new name. Has he said what that's to be? Christopher. Father James pulls an admiring face. That's nice. Swimmer. He gestures towards the table where a nondescript stack of black wool lies neatly folded. That's your other set. You'll have two of everything. We do give you boots, but unless the ones you have are outlandish in some way, which I see they're not, you can keep those that you've got now until you need new. Saves on cost. Good. Right then. Let's have those things off you and I'll put them by ready. You know all the other bits that happen. You have to promise you aren't married and you haven't got any incurable disease. And there's the blessing and sensing of your robes, the presentation of the rule and your promises and everything. Father Theodore been through it all with you? No? Well, he will. It's any day now, isn't it? Thanks, don't worry, I can fold it for you. 
Brother Christopher, eh? Good. That'll sit well on you. Colin feels vaguely out of his body as he drifts to the door, his mind expanded into the magnitude of what he is about to undertake. A lifetime of celibacy? What? Nothing to call his own ever again? Swearing absolute felty to the abbot? And Father John occasionally looks more than grim. But this, he doesn't understand why something deeper than his viscera reaches out for it so ravenously. This, he's glimpsed it in the brethren, this way of faithfulness and self-control is like a mountain spring, like sweet water bubbling up from among mud and rocks, so peace and joy emerge from it. He, everything in him, wants this. With his hand on the latch, suddenly he remembers his manners and turns, blushing. I'm so sorry, he says humbly. I forgot to say thank you. Not, I hope you know, not because I'm ungrateful. It's overwhelming. Thank you, Father James. Thank you so much. And James is laughing at him, amused at the excitement and exaltation. God bless you, he says. Welcome to the family. Oh, could you drop this into Father Theodore for me? Father Gilbert asked me, would I bring it up to him after chapel this morning, but I forgot. And he asked, could you and Brother Cassian and Brother Boniface stay in choir afternoon to go through some of the music for next week? He said he looked for Theo, uh, Father Theodore, after chapter to ask him, but he couldn't see him. Colin looks at him and Father James says, is that all right? Uh, oh, aye, indeed. Me and Brother Cassian and Brother Boniface, I'll ask permission. He thinks it better to keep to himself the thoughts passing through his head, trying to imagine being on such familiar terms with his quiet, serious novice master. Theo. It gives him a glimpse into a whole different web of relationships. Colin takes the mass setting held out to him and Father James, with a friendly grin, waves him goodbye. The robing room is only two doors along from the novitiate, but these workrooms are large. It is quite a length of corridor. As he goes along clutching the book to his chest, Colin practices walking how Father Theodore showed him. The trick of it is, this is how the novice master put it, to pick your feet up rather than put them down, if you see what I mean. Not splat, splat, splat like a flat-footed, overweight alewife, and not striding along like a knight of the realm with the heels striking sparks from the flagstones. This is God's earth, and you're walking softly on it. Your tread must become a humble touch, gentle, no swagger, no braggadocio. There should be a concentration of quietness and humility emanating from your presence like smoke from incense. And it shouldn't be billowing out so intensely silent and self-mortifying 
that the fragrant clouds of it choke everyone to death either. Just gentle. Just calm. Just at peace. It sounds lovely. He tries this walk and feels a bit self-conscious. He thinks he probably looks more like his feet have blisters. Father Theodore didn't mean hobbling. Looking round to make sure no one's watching, he nips back to the robing room door and tries again. There is a plantedness, a sort of supple heaviness in the way the Solemns walk. He strives to capture it, can't, wonders if he ever will. Maybe you need to actually feel peaceful to achieve it. Or maybe achieving it is a way of walking toward the peace. He doesn't know. But reaching the novitiate door for the second time, he thinks he'd better go in. He has been somewhat in awe of the novice master, but Theo, perhaps that day will come to him too. Somewhere far into the future, Perhaps that's what he will say. And what will they call him? Chris? Second half of the chapter. This is the moment to pause the video and grab yourself a cup of tea if you want to. Chapter 5, part 2. Frumenti, served by his mother's hands with roast pheasant and onions, plenty of herbs. It was pleasant enough. It made a change from bread and filled up a lad's belly. Very welcome. Then he had entered monastic life when Brother Andrew held the obedience of Cook and he made frumenti too. But he had different ideas about it. Onions, yes, boiled. Herbs, to a certain extent. No salt because it was expensive. Sometimes a bit runny, like porridge. Sometimes a dollop that needed a whack from the server to shift it off the spoon into a man's bowl. And then, Lord have mercy and deliver us. Sixteen years with Brother Cormac's cooking. Now, his rendition of frumenti was something else altogether. How does he do it? Brother Tom used sometimes to wonder, how does he contrive to make cracked wheat lumpy? The man has a sort of genius headed in all the wrong directions. And herbs? Nothing out of a recipe mind. Any herbs. Anything fresh anything dried, whatever he had in store. Dill and mint and a few cloves chucked in because the pepper had run out. Fennel seed and cumin seed and a good old branch of rosemary because it grew a plenty to ramp up the flavour. Salt, maybe. Sometimes he'd cook it in wine, sometimes in broth he had left over. Cormac! would even bung in a handful of fungi from the woods if the mood took him. No one but Cormac thought eating mushrooms could be any kind of a good idea. Heaven knows men have died from eating mushrooms. Besides which, if you don't get them fresh, they can be crawling with maggots. Father Peregrine was an inspired man for simplicity and following in the way of Jesus, and in no respect did he carry out his vision more radically and powerfully than appointing Brother Cormac as St Alcuin's cook. Sixteen years. Glory be to God that must have made us holy. If that hasn't knocked every brother a decade off purgatory, 
There can't be anything wood. But then, oh, manna, a salvation of sorts. Along came Brother Conradus. And when he makes frumenti, it's a different story. Oh, sweet mother of God, Brother Conradus is frumenti. It has honey, it has cinnamon, it has almonds, it has milk, it has cream eye and butter, it has nutmeg grated on it. It's not slack and runny and bitter. It's not solid and stodgy. It's cut to perfection. What's that Latin word? Dolce. Hmm. Describes Brother Coronadus' frumenti to a T. Every brother of the house has had need to let his belt out a notch or two since Abbot John let Brother Conradus loose in the abbey kitchen. And life is pleasanter and the men are more cheerful. It's nice having a supper you can look forward to on a cold wet day. It makes life better to know the butter won't be rancid and you won't be having to ignore bits of blue mould on the bread. The only thing about it is Possibly meal times can loom larger than they should. There are times now when the northeaster blows frigid off the moor, the days are dark and the nights bitter, when supper is actually the highlight of the day. Who could make a case for that being admirable religion? But what wouldn't I give? For a nice big dish of Brother Conradus's frumenti in front of me now. I wonder if this mare is hungry. I wonder if there's a difference from hay to hay. If some of it is more like Brother Andrew's suppers and some of it, God save us, resembles Brother Cormac's. And if there's some kinds of hay all green and fragrant with herbs, a distillation of summer that corresponds to the wonders Conradus dishes up. Horses like grain. I wonder, suppose they were hungry, if they'd eat frumenti. At least give it a try. All the while these ramblings drift and swirl through Brother Thomas's mind, the sturdy chestnut mare keeps her leisurely pace, carrying him through the beautiful hills and dales of North Yorkshire, through the mellow golden warmth of this September day. And at last, a bit saddle stiff, he doesn't have any call to ride out this far so often these days. Tom recognises the long, narrow lane that runs like a riverbed between tall, graceful, overarching trees and describes a curve to the right and then there's the silvered oak gate of Coldbeck Cottage. Right welcome sight and none too soon. He can't actually swing his leg back to dismount from this horse with two sacks of grain up behind him. He urges her close to the gate and reaches down to flip over the heavy iron latch and then it pushes open easily. Within the barest minute the cottage door opens and out comes the abbot's brother-in-law, William de Bulmer, 30 years a monk, now a householder. Well met! He calls out in surprise. I wasn't expecting you. What's brought you here? No trouble, I hope. He laughs. Oh, I see. You can't get down. Let me heft those off for you. Whoa, steady girl. Brother Tom explains that for once no searing tragedy has befallen them. John simply wanted to be sure they had some grain in store and wouldn't be worried about facing lean days in the winter. 
Not that he doesn't think you're provident, don't take me wrong. He thought you'd be well off for peas and eggs and cheese, just maybe having to pay these high prices to get grain from market. That's thoughtful, says William. That's kind. God reward you. Will you come round with me to the stable? If I give this lass a rub down, would you fetch her a pail of water from the well yonder? So they settle the mare comfortably with a drink and a net of hay, then stroll back to the house. We... William hesitates. I expect I'd better tell you, before we go in, we have something of yours. Brother Tom looks baffled. Something of mine? That's clever work, since I don't even have anything to call me own. Aye, well, I think you'll call this your own. Further puzzled by this cryptic reply, Brother Thomas follows William through the house door, which opens directly into the big room where they eat and cook and work and read and relax. The room with the huge fireplace, with its iron pot slung on chains over smouldering embers, with the comfortable scrubbed oak table on which bread and cheese and ale and fruit, welcome sight, have been set out. And there, at the table, half rising from his stool in dismay, aghast to be greeted with the unexpected sight of the abbot's big burly esquire, the tense form and blanching face of Brother Said. Tomorrow we go on to chapter six. And if this was your bedtime story, sleep well, night night, mind the fleas don't bite.